Hey everyone, it's Berm, and this is Level Zero Networking. In the last video, we discussed the basics of MPLS using a simple lab. If you haven't watched that video yet, I highly recommend you go and check it out now. But MPLS alone on an island doesn't accomplish much. Its true power comes in it being transparent to overlay traffic, which allows for multiple protocols to traverse the network without the MPLS environment needing to understand the traffic at every hop. I want to give you a quick tidbit about VPNs before we start. When we think of a VPN, we immediately think encryption. These two things have become synonymous, but VPNs don't have to be encrypted. Tis blasphemy! A VPN really just forwards overlay traffic across an underlay. The earliest VPNs didn't use any encryption, and an L3 VPN is a traditional VPN, meaning no encryption. Because of this, it shouldn't be considered a security measure, as all traffic will be unencrypted unless you add encryption. So, what is an L3 VPN? L3 VPNs traverse an MPLS environment between Provider Edge or PE routers. So far, we've only gone over transport labels, also referred to as outer and top stack labels. L3 VPNs introduce a new label that is added to the stack called the VPN label, also referred to as inner, SBIT, and bottom of stack labels. This label maps to an IP prefix or service on the PE router. In the last video, I mentioned that once all the labels are popped, an IP lookup is performed. And why do we need the VPN label at all? The addition of the VPN labels creates a mechanism to see how and where the lookup is performed. It enables the use of multiple VRF instances. It also allows for multi-address family support, such as IPv4, IPv6, and eVPN. MPLS as a data plane for eVPN isn't supported on BIOS yet. For the most part, MPLS will operate the same when using L3 VPN, with a key difference. The MPLS packet will have two shim headers now instead of one. One header is the transport label, and the other is the VPN label. The transport label will be pushed by the head NPE and then swapped on every hop along the path. Once we get to the next to last hop in the path, the transport label will be fully popped. Remember PHP from part one. Once the packet reaches the tail NPE, the only label left in the stack will now be the VPN label. The PE will perform the lookup for the service and the address family the label indicates, and will finally pop the VPN label as the packet goes towards that service. In this video, we're going to build L3 VPNs across the MPLS environment. We'll be setting up the MPLS environment again in case you need to get familiar with those commands again. For our topology, we'll have two PE routers, two P routers, and two CE routers. The PE routers are provider edge and connect to the CE routers or the customer edge routers. The P routers are the internal provider routers and only connect to other provider equipment. Just like in the first video, we're going to set up OSPF between all our label switch routers or LSRs. This will include the P and PE routers. First, let's set up the interfaces. We'll be using the IP scheme displayed in the topology. Now we'll configure OSPF. The point to point links are the physical links connected between the routers. In this case, ETH0 connects from PE1 to P1. The dummy interface is a standard practice for MPLS. It allows for a peering to occur so long as there is a connection up between the neighbors. I'm going to go ahead and configure the remaining routers. You'll notice the one difference is that the P routers have two point to point interfaces. That's because they both connect to a P and PE router. Now let's commit and save, and then we'll check on OSPF. To check OSPF, we'll run show IP route OSPF. As you can see, we have all the loopback addresses in OSPF. Now we'll go ahead and configure our label in position. Just as in the first part, we're going to use label distribution protocol or LDP. LDP will automatically set the labels for each router. We'll go ahead and set the MPLS interface, which will be the same as the LDP interface. We're also going to use the dummy interface for appearing. The interfaces are available from the last config using OSPF. Finally, we'll set the router ID for MPLS to the loopback IP address. I'll go ahead and configure the other provider routers now. As with OSPF, the P routers will have two interfaces configured instead of one. Once again, we'll commit and save. Now we'll verify that we have labels assigned to our dummy interfaces. To do that, we'll run show MPLS LDP binding. 
As you can see, we've got labels assigned to all of the loopback addresses. Next, let's configure the L3 VPNs in the VPN v4 address family of each PE. As it states in the v4, these will be IPv4 prefixes. In this config, we're creating a VRF called A and then mapping it to the Linux table 101. These commands will allow the IPv4 addresses to be imported and exported between the local VRF and the VPN v4 address family. This command will tell VPN v4 what VPN label to assign for this traffic. By selecting auto, a label will be assigned by the zebra routing daemon. You can statically define these if desired. When using VRFs, you're able to use the same subnet on many different VRFs. You can have the 10.000/24 prefix exist a thousand times in an environment. BGP, however, only likes to forward on the best path. By default, BGP will only advertise one of those thousand routes, likely the oldest in this case. VPN v4 needs a way to make each of these thousand prefixes be unique. That's the point of a route distinguisher. It is a measure to ensure that each prefix is unique. If a VRF has an RD of 65,000 colon 1, it'll make the full VPN v4 prefix look like this. Also, RDs are 64-bit values typically configured as colon separated values in these formats. Like with route distinguishers, route targets help solve the issue with having multiple identical prefixes in different VRFs. When a remote PE receives those thousand different 10.000/24 prefixes, it needs some way to know which BGP table those routes need to get dumped into. That's the purpose of route targets. Route targets get attached to BGP prefixes, NLRIs, as extended communities. When the remote PE receives the NLRI, it is now able to look at its VRF config and see which VRFs these prefixes need to get dumped into. With route targets, we can import and export. An export just says that any VRF prefix that it advertises to remote PEs will add a route to the NLRI. And an import says that an NLRI received from a remote PE is allowed to be placed in the BGP table for that VRF. It is possible to import multiple route targets in any VRF. This is essentially the basis for route leaking. Each VRF just needs to put the other VRF's route target and leaking has occurred. The both command here indicates that both an import and export action should be performed on this route target. And finally, we'll set the BGP AS number. We're gonna be using IBGP between the loopbacks on the PE routers and the IPv4 VPN address family. IBGP is the desired VPN v4 deployment due to its native next hop unchanged behavior. If we were gonna scale this, we could add a route reflector as well, similar to some of the earlier videos. IBGP allows reflected routes to still have their own original next hops. This allows traffic to go directly between route reflector clients instead of traversing the route reflector like hub and spoke. We'll add the IPv4-VPN command, the remote AS, and make our update source our dummy interface. Now let's head over to PE2 and make those changes over there as well. Keep in mind, these are the same commands that we just input on PE1. However, feel free to pause if you want to review them again. For connectivity between the CEs and PEs, we'll use a simple eBGP config. We're going to use VRFA that we created earlier. Then we'll add our network, address family, and remote AS. Then we'll go over to PE2 and do the same thing. We haven't configured the CEs at all yet, so we're going to go ahead and do that now. We'll go ahead and configure the interfaces. And now we'll do BGP. We're going to be advertising our local interface into BGP. Next, we'll do CE2. Now let's commit and save the CEs and the PEs. Now let's go ahead and test our connectivity between CE1 and CE2. As you can see, it succeeded. Now let's go ahead and pull up a Wireshark packet capture. We can see in this packet capture that there are two MPLS labels in the stack. The S bit on the second label is set to one. This indicates that it is the bottom of the stack label. Back over on the CLI, we're going to check BGP and the MPLS LDP binding. We can see that to get to 10.0.2.0, we need to go to 10.0.0.4. In the LDP binding, we see the next hop for 10.0.0.4 is 10.0.0.2 with a label of 18. Now, let's see how the VPN or bottom of stack label is determined. Here, we can see a remote label of 144. We can also see that the route entry has the RD appended to it. And we can also see the RT has been attached to the NLRI. You can also see these values in the show IP route VRF command.
Now let's check out the wire strike between P1 and P2. Here, we can see the exact same labels as the first hop. You might think this is the same capture due to the labels being the same. This illustrates that labels are locally significant for each router. We can see, though, that the TTL is decremented by 1. Let's head back over to the CLI again and quickly verify the LDP binding table on P1. Now, on the packet capture between P2 and PE2, we can see that we only have the VPN label. We know that because the S bit is set to 1. This means we should have received an implicit null from PE2 on P2. Let's go ahead and verify that now. As expected, there's the imp null value. Lastly, let's check the routing table to see the VPN nature of this traffic. On P1, we'll show IP route VRF all. From this, we can see the P nodes have no idea of the VRFA prefixes, and yet CE1 and CE2 are communicating just fine. Well, that's it for this video. Hopefully, MPLS is becoming a little less intimidating at this point. If you enjoyed the content, make sure to drop a like, and if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel.